I'm joined today by Major General, uh, Army National Guard, Major General Frank McGinn. And uh, we have the bridge dedication, the park dedication coming up. We're honoring really 16 generals since the Revolutionary War, but seven in the more contemporary time. And, and General McGinn, you're one of the ones we're honoring. So it's, it's a thrill to have you here to talk a little bit about your life story uh, and how you came to where you are today. So welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Happy to be here. And another, another Quincy connection. All roads lead to Quincy, we always joke about. But you grew up in Adam Shore. Maybe you talk a little bit about uh, growing up in Adam Shore and your family, mom and dad. And sure, yeah, Adam, Adam Shore is a great neighborhood. I mean, the, the memories I have now are really, it seemed like there was 30 to 35 kids in your age group. Uh, I'm sure it wasn't that many, but there was, there was always something going on. It was either basketball games, street hockey games. You know, tackle football without pads. It was just a, a great neighborhood to grow up in. Um, and, you know, remember in the earlier days, uh, the whole neighborhood would get on Adam Shore Beach, on Heron, Heron Road Beach in Adam Shore. And, they were, you know, we, I guess we thought we were at Nantasket or the Cape, but everyone was laid out with the coolers and the, and the things, and every, every family in the neighborhood was there. But, uh, and then you had uh, swimming lessons down there that we begrudgingly were sent down to to do rain or shine. Uh, the Quincy Recreation Department. It was just always something going on. So it was, a, it was a, a really a fantastic upbringing in that neighborhood. Um, and you know, there wasn't the helicopter parents of the, the day you have today. I mean, you would. Quincy is a large city in Massachusetts, but uh, it's it's a small city in many ways, and it's made up of so many neighborhoods. And uh, you're talking about Adam Shaw. Adam Shaw was one of those was those neighborhoods, special neighborhoods. They just had a uniqueness. It's the families, and of course, it's the coast. Uh, Quincy has a lot of waterfront, and I'm sure it's one of those great spots. Um, and I know you mentioned Heron, Heron Beach and, and hanging out down there. Um, did you guys do any boating? Did you do any hustling around in the bay? Uh, we, uh, you know, it, it's actually funny. We, we had a small little dinghy that had a small engine on it that we, we would keep moored right down the beach. But after watching Jaws in 1975, I think I was petrified to even swim out to it off of the jetty. Um, and we had canoes and things like that, but never any... Uh, anything more than that. So um, we, were, we were busy. We, we, we all, myself, my two brothers, all played Quincy Youth Hockey uh, from an early age, and we were playing co-club baseball back then at the time. So we really didn't get into the, the boating aspect of it, but uh, certainly utilized the beach and uh, would jump off the seawall uh, over by uh, Shelton Road was one of our favorites. And then uh, I guess I can say this now, but and jumping off the, uh, the, um, the boat yacht over off of Palmer Street too, we'd go to the roof and, and leap off of that as well. So, uh, it's definitely cringe if your kids did it today, right? Exactly. So you you had actually two career paths going at one time. So you you, you joined the state police, uh, eventually becoming colonel. I think you retired. It? I, uh, major. Yes. Major. Yes. So major state police. When did you uh, join the state police, and when did you think about uh, the guard? Yeah. So the guard was really first. So right right out of high school in uh, in. August of 1981, I graduated uh, from Archbishop Williams in May. Um, I wanted to go to college, and you know, I was looking for ways, creative ways to, to finance it, and looked, saw the guard, and was, you know, they were paying tuition. I wanted to do both. I, I, st I wanted to serve, but I also still wanted to go to college. I didn't want to delay college, so that was the you know the impetus that drove me into enlisting in the guard in '81. Um, and then after about four years, I, I made it to the rank of E4 and then attended Officer Candidate School and, and got my commission as a second lieutenant. Um, so that was around 84, I believe, when I got commissioned. And then I um, joined the state. I actually was a police officer down the Cape uh, in the town of Dennis for two years from 1986 to 1988, and then joined the State Police Academy in 1988. Um, so it, it's... Um, I don't know what brought me into law enforcement. It, uh, my uncle was a police officer in Boston, so I guess uh, he was more some, somewhat of a role model. And I think serving in the Guard, I still had that, I think, that service mentality and uh, thought I would, I would try it out in law enforcement. And it turned into a 30-year you know, career with the state police, which, uh, which actually paralleled the Guard well. Um, they, they were very um, um, flexible with the time and gave you the opportunity to be able to do both jobs. So challenging sometimes, you'd, you'd work at night and then have to get up and do your reserve duty on the weekends. But it was a different guard back then too. We weren't as uh, operationalized as we are today. So the, it was really the two weekends, uh, one weekend a month and the two weeks and usually in the summer was, was the normal routine back in those earlier years. Well, it's, it's interesting you say that because if, if you look at the guard, uh, you know, and you look at their involvement, and, and I know you, you saw some pretty serious action, but 
you know, Desert Storm, Iraq, Afghanistan, the God's been a big part of that, uh, part of the unit with, with the Army. Sure, yeah, I, I've seen the Guard evolve from, from when I came in in 1981. Uh, you know, I remember the Guard from 1978, from the blizzard, but I was, I was 15. I just remember seeing the trucks and what they were doing and when the, the area was under siege uh, from that storm. Um, but then, uh, you know, in 81, uh, we, we weren't the, the Guard force we are today, that's for sure. And I saw that mature into the 90s, uh, different concepts and doctrines came out, and then really Desert Storm was, was one of the first, I think, challenges for the Guard of having to mobilize units. Uh, at the time, I was in the unit in Quincy on Hancock Street. It was the 126th Signal Battalion. And we, were, we would have gone eventually if that had prolonged. Uh, obviously, it didn't. It was, it was short in duration. But the unit in Hingham, the 1058 Transportation Company, went over. And there was some growing pains, that, you know, mobilizing that force, you know, doing your load plans, getting them out. We always trained for it. But in reality, actually having to, to, to perform that and hadn't done it in I don't know how long, maybe maybe World War II, there was minimal action in Korea and Vietnam. So there was, uh, there was some growing pains. 9-11 uh, was a game changer, absolute game changer, uh, where really the, oper the Guard became an operational force rather than a strategic reserve. And now we've got you know, guardsmen and women that have, have done multiple deployments over there. And I think it's a good thing. It, keep, it keeps, the, keeps the guard and the other reserve components uh, fresh, keeps them well-trained, keeps them ready. So it, and I think it's a positive. And yet now you have young men and women joining because they want to deploy. They join the guard because they want to get into some action, but they want to have a career as well. And I think that's what, what the guard provides uh, as opposed to just going active component and for a period of time and coming out or making a career. I mean, they're all good alternatives. You're Frank McGinn. Talk a little bit about who you're named for. So, yeah, my, my namesake, uh, Lieutenant, uh, First Lieutenant Francis M. McGinn, uh, was from Dorchester, Mass. He was in the National Guard, 101st Infantry um, Battalion, and he was mobilized for World War II. And uh, tragically, he was killed in Leyte in, uh, on October 25th, 1944. Uh, my dad was seven, and, you know, his other siblings um, were, were all obviously all young as well. So. But, uh, you know, a great family history and legacy, and uh, I couldn't be more proud. Uh, when I commissioned, uh, my father gave me his, uh, I think it was his first lieutenant. I, when I made first lieutenant, he gave me his first lieutenant bar that I, I still have. So, uh, yeah, he was a Boston school teacher, and, you know, just like today, you know, post 9-11, and he got called, and he ended up answering and, and ended up going. So, but uh, you know, my father went on, did a couple of years in the Army. My uncle, Timmy, he was in the Marine Corps. Uh, for 19 years, and my uncle Arthur was in the Army, fought in Korea, and my uncle Kevin was in the Navy. So even having lost their dad at young age, they all still went on to continue to serve. Uh, so it's, it's a, and then my brother, my brother Sean was in the Army as well for four years. So it's in the blood. It is, it is. It, they, they always say it's a family business. And, uh, well, I got to believe uh, how proud your grandfather would be to see you attain the rank of uh, uh, Major General. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. So uh, you know, I'm more you know, proud of his, of his service to the country back then and what he did managing a large family and, and having to go. But we knew the guy. You never, you never thought about this track, right? No. You no. ever think about you being no. a general? Or? No, I, I thought I was going to do my six years, get out. And, uh, and it's funny, we, 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 we joke when you make captain, it's you know, well, that's a big deal. When you make field grade major, you, you figure you've hit the, the pinnacle. And, uh, but I tell you, the, the Army and the Guard both prepares you for the next level. Uh, through assignments, through education. So, as long as you're, uh, you, you know, you're putting your your all in and you're working, and uh, it, the system really works and it brings you along uh, and, and allows you to continue to serve uh, in certain positions. So, uh, yeah, but I, I would never. Have, I think if you ask any general officer, they'd, they'd all say the same thing that they never would have, you know, thought. Uh, with maybe some few a few exceptions, but. Uh, no, with the obviously with the guard, state police at the same time. Um, you, to say a little bit, there's some similarities. Did, did one help you more than the other side? And was it was it state police helping you on this that side, or the guard really helping you on the state police side, or was it? Actually, it was. It's really neither. I think. I mean, I was. I, I think I was savvy enough to put uh, eggs in both baskets. So I I, I didn't uh, focus too much on one of the careers, and I think I did a pretty good job of turning one on, and turning the other one off, and. Uh, so I was able to still take promotional exams in the state police and, and make rank and get into leadership positions there while I was simultaneously doing it in the, in the military as well. Um, but, you know, the good part is, that, again, they, they were, until you get to the senior levels and the requirements become more, you know, more intense, uh, more time required, it really becomes a collision at, at some point. And that was really my, my decision to retire a couple of years ago. I was doing a, a disservice to both jobs. So I just made the decision that I was retirement eligible, let someone else move up on the state police 
take over that troop and uh, and put at this stage in my life put more focus into you know my my current assignment down in, in Washington D.C. So. We have a mutual friend, Billy O'Brien, who says he was in Office of Candidate School together with you, he, but it worked out for you. It did. Yeah, Billy. Billy had a great career. Billy retired as a colonel. Um, actually, he, he was he went to Norwich, commissioned out of there. Um, was about a couple of years uh, behind me growing up, but we, we, we grew up in the Signal Battalion. And uh, it's funny, you, you, you have those lifelong friendships, and, and Billy was one of them. And uh, we, we, we play a little hockey together, too, so that's always another part of that, that, that friendship. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I, I know we're talking about the generals and, and the history of the city, but um, Quincy per capita-wise, you know, the amount of people that just sign up to serve, whatever branch they chose, it's pretty remarkable. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a big part of our history, who we are. It's one of those communities that, uh, you know, so South Boston, Dorchester, similar. Uh, it was, you know, you wanted to serve. It was just, it was just it was part of the DNA, if you will. And certainly with your bloodline, it made perfect sense. Right. Uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, the type of um, activity you've seen directly. Uh, war's not pretty, uh, and, and uh, I know, you know, I've talked to other generals, General Dunford, over, over the years, and, and, and the, you know, the job is to be ready, best trained, prepared when that time comes, when the call comes. You know, um, it's the policy makers up above that set the policy, and but it, but you guys have to execute. I mean, the, again, the, the prep is, is intense, but it's good. Uh, at a division level, you, you go to what they call warfighter exercises, which are uh, designed to be intense, designed to be stressful. And at the you know brigade, battalion level, they go through the combat training centers, so force on force, and those are requirements before you actually uh, will deploy, you know, downrange and, and get over there. So. But yeah, the, the intensity over there can be good. I, I didn't have a bad job. I, I was at uh, a forward operating base, so it's it's you know not not to be uh, you know to be funny about it, but it was technically called the mayor. So I had all the life support and uh, the base defense operations, the force protection uh, for a, a base of about 12,000 folks, There's some third country nationals, a bunch of different 06 uh, you know colonel level commands, and then about four to six kilometers around that base was was kind of my operating space. So. Um, I mean, the real the real threat over there at that point in 2005 was either indirect fire, which we would, would take you know fairly routinely, or or traveling uh, either over the road because of IEDs or if, if you're flying um, from some sort of you know attack there. But but it wasn't I wasn't in you know going through the cities and kicking down doors, so I didn't I didn't experience that. Um, but it, it was it was real. Uh, the, the, the first time I think it was the first time a National Guard division actually had a a large battle space over in, in Iraq, and that was the 42nd Infantry Division out of New York. So I was assigned to them at the time. And uh, But we had uh, third ID with us. Uh, we replaced first ID out of Germany, and then we got replaced by the 101st uh, Air Assault Division out of Fort Campbell. Um, but so again, I had a pretty good experience, but we had a combat surgical hospital there, so we would see the, the injured coming in every day, flying in, and, and really the nurses, literally, they'd be having a cookout and would drop what they're doing just to go give blood themselves if they were off off duty. So really inspiring to see um, just the, the way people you know, operated and fought over there. I mean, no one ever wants to get into something like that. Uh, it's when, you know, it's when, really when diplomacy fails. Uh, but it's, you train for it and you, you, you know, you train your whole career for it and you have to be ready when you get over there. Um, so you really have to pay attention in the training, make sure you're ready uh, and make sure you, you're able to be survivable and care for the people under your charge when you when you get over there. The further you went along in the rank, and of course, uh, you know, two-star general is very impressive. I mean, it doesn't happen every day. Uh, as you as you were going along the line, I mean, um, I'm sure you read a little bit more about history, a little more about the military. Uh, was there a favorite general or two along the way that um, either historically or, or contemporary time? I, obviously, we got generals from Marymount just up the street from Adam Shore, right. but. Right. I don't know if, uh, if that ever crossed your mind, who, who you'd like to emulate or... Um, I mean, if you look historically, uh, you know, General Patton was certainly uh, an interesting general, uh, <laughs> vivacious uh, personality. Uh, what, one thing I like about him is uh, in one of the you know, schools we were in, they, they showed a document where he was rating one of the other generals, and his comment on it was, he's the best general in the Army, and I know them all. <laughs> Something to that effect, so very short and to the point. Uh, but contemporaneously, uh, you know, obviously General Dunford uh, and General McConville both are, are you know, 
living legends, honestly. Did and, you know them growing up at all? I, I did not. Uh, General McCauvill's dad was a hockey ref in Quincy Youth, so I think he might have tackled me once or twice and, and threw me in the sin bin um, while we were playing. But I did know his younger brother, uh, Paul. Uh, we used to run around because Marymount being so close to Adam Shore, we, you know, we, we did still kind of hang with the Marymount kids and as well as Germantown and House Neck as well where those four neighborhoods uh, you know, were adjacent to each other. Uh, so I didn't know. He was five years, I believe, ahead of me at, at Archbishop Williams and then obviously went on to West Point. But, but as far as, uh, and we have General Milley now, the current chairman of the Gen Chiefs, uh, you know, is, is, you know, we see it. North Shore guy, right? It's North Shore, Winchester. Um, but uh, they're, they're, I mean, General Dunford, I, I, I saw him at the South Com Commander's Change of Command and he got up there with no notes and you know talked about the admiral um admiral kurt who was a, f a friend of the family's retirement and went through his whole career every assignment he had every ship he served on um just from just from knowing him i think and, and just the, the type of leader he is uh, so he's he's certainly inspiring uh it's funny you mentioned general Patton. general Patton's son was also a general that's right and, and back in 75 or 76 he was the grand marshal for the flag day in quincy okay. so i was a kid at the time and uh you know, he had all the tanks with him and the kids had a blast uh at the time but then you went on to become a grand marshal dunford did mcconville did ronald ran from the air force also had been grand marshals with with the flag day so it's been a great tradition yeah uh and, and yeah. you mentioned playing in the cold clip so i'm sure you marched in the, as a kid in the parade. I, I did, as I was mentioning before, going on camera, I said, my mother found the picture of me holding the banner in <laughs> fact from, I don't know what grade it was, but yeah, I met uh, General uh, Patton, uh, the son's uh, wife had, had dropped the hockey puck for a West Point Bruins alumni game, and I was talking to her afterwards at the, the coalition, so she was very interesting. To, to talk to her and, and, and hear about, you know, General Patton. And, uh, and I, I think they were Hamilton, Mass. Correct, they're from Hamilton. I believe he, he was a goalie at West Point, I believe. Oh, no summer, kidding. I believe so. Yeah, you, I'm, I'm kind of a history buff, and I, I do like the World War II era. Patton was just incredible. What right. courage on that guy. I mean, he, um, you know, he, he had trouble sometimes keeping his mouth <laughs> shut, but when they wanted the dirty job to get done, he's the guy that got it. Exactly. Uh, um, we're living in a different time. And uh, you talk about your grandfather, your father, the greatest generation. Um, and uh, today, it's still the greatest country in the world. But, but this past year, you know, I think we're looking at the soul of our country and, and, and looking at, okay, uh, where do we go from here? And one of the concerns I have uh, as mayor and chair of the school committee is uh, people coming out of our schools, are they learning the history? Are they getting to know the history? And, and uh, I don't know if you want to comment on that. And... Uh, you know, you learn from history. You, you, you can't eliminate history, you know, and, and so many, I think, just in this time, just want to eliminate history and who we are, um, and, and that, that troubles me a little bit. And then I want to ask you a little bit about what you'd recommend to a young person, whether coming out of college or coming out of high school. Talk a little bit about leadership, because it, it's, that's, that's not something necessarily, you, it's the perfect definition in the dictionary. It's, it's, it's part of living life and who you are, but maybe a little bit about um, the times we're in. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we can't lose sight of history. I mean, it, our history is our history, good, bad, or indifferent. And, you know, my personal opinion is that we, we can't lose sight of that. It needs to continue to be taught in schools. And I think you can do it concurrently. We're talking about, you know, current affairs as well. I don't think it, it necessarily has to be one or the other. But I, I don't think we, we certainly shouldn't be doing one or the other. We need to have uh, some hard conversations, some difficult conversations. The one thing about the military is, you know, it, it's really a melting pot. I mean, we've got all, you know, races, sexes, sexual preferences, and, uh, and we can have those conversations, and we do. And, it, and it's, uh, it's, it's really mandated that we do that. I mean, it, if you're not doing that, then you're not leading. And so I, I've got an interesting, um, a really diverse group of folks where I work, and I love having those conversations. I'll just go sit down one-on-one -on -one with folks and ask about, and about current affairs. I ask what they think. And I've got people that grew up in some tough areas in New York City. I've got people that grew up in the South. Uh, so we, we embrace it, and we, we, we like to have those conversations. I hear this story from my son who's in the Marines who's met kids from all over the country and right. all colors and backgrounds, and they have some fun breaking each other's chops, but at the end of the day, they walk watching each other's backs. Right. You know, right. And, uh, and I think that's the fun, the, the camaraderie part of that, and being able to, to have, poke fun at each other, I think, is important, too. I think if we get too sensitive over it, uh, we've got, we're going to lose that. And that's I think part of the problem is we, we 
it's I don't know when, when this happened, but you can't have that discussion anymore. It's 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 uh, I'm a position over here, a position over there, and you can't find that middle ground. That's the challenge politically right now. Uh, find that middle ground. You know, we can disagree, but we don't have to be disagreeable about it. You know. And that's, that's what the military brings, is that, that commonality and that common bond, and again, that, that esprit de corps and that morale. So they're all, again, from different walks of life, and you all come in. And one of the things the Guard is doing lately, which I thought was fascinating, and they, they, they tell you when you're mentoring some of these young folks now, you don't ask them where they're from, you ask them how they grew up, because it's going to provoke a completely different response. So if you ask me where I'm from, I'm going to say I'm from Quincy, or I'm from Adam Schub. If you ask me how I grew up, I'm going to talk about you know, those 30 kids the same age and playing the sports. And so you're going to get a completely different, uh, different answer from them just by changing that question a little bit. So your advice to a young man or woman coming out of high school or college or trying to figure it out, thinking about the military, maybe thinking about law enforcement, about leadership, what would you say? I mean, I, I'm, I'm obviously biased, so I'm, I'm going to tell them that uh, the, the experience you get in the military, whether it's reserves or active component, uh, is invaluable. I mean, you're, you're, you're thrown into situations at a younger age and really, I mean, they train for it, they, they, they train, but you're still going to, you're going to make, you're going to make mistakes. And we encourage you to make mistakes, because that's how you learn. Uh, but you're just thrown into those situations where you, you have to lead if you're going to be successful. Uh, and, and, you know, my career, you know, I owe it all to the NCOs. I'll, I'll, I say that all the time and I beat that drum. I've had, I had great NCOs as a second lieutenant that taught me, you know, right from wrong and what to do. Uh, and all the way up to my current position now. I mean, I, 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 and I, I don't know where I got that. I, I don't know if somebody told me that or if that was some early on, but I latched onto that that you know, paradigm immediately and it served me well. I've got sergeants major that are still friends. We still stay in touch and we still talk to each other that are long retired, either, either from Iraq overseas or, even, or locally here. But I, I would, yeah, I would always, again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm always a, rec a recruiter. I don't think, I think everybody is that wears the uniform. But I, I tell them the, the pros, the cons, and, and what they can get out of leadership. And you're, not, you're really not going to get that in any, any sort of schooling or in a college or a high school even. Um, it's, just, it's just unique, and, and it's something that I, I encourage people to do. So if I hear someone's interested, I, I'm mentoring a young man now that's looking to go to Norwich and, and then come in the guard afterwards. So, but he's, he's, he's driven. He knows what he wants. Um, he watched that Make Your Bed video from Admiral McRaven, and he, it just – put him on this track where he knows what he wants to do. One of the generals we're honoring, Gordon Sullivan, was a Norwich guy. That's right. Went on to become Chief of Staff of the Army. Um, yeah, grade school, Bill O'Brien, another Norwich guy. Um, Mike Kosky, another you know, Quincy guy, retired lieutenant colonel, another Norwich. They, uh, yeah, they're networking. Uh, you know, you say they're thick as thieves, or <laughs> thick as, as tight as, as the West Point. You know, I think General McCall would probably differ, uh, beg to differ on that one. But uh. So, as, as we've talked a little bit about, we're honoring 16 generals from Quincy since the Revolutionary War. We've kind of zeroed in on, on seven, you being one of the seven. Oh, I'll let you say how do you, How do you feel about it? How does it hit you? First of all, ex extremely humbling. I mean, it's, it's it, I can't put it into words how humbling it is. Uh, and to stand among the giants that are being recognized in this. And really, i got to say thank, thanks to you and to the city for doing this. Because I think it's important to keep that history and that legacy. Uh, and it, and uh, I, I look at it, I, I see mine, I think, as representative. One is my grandfather's service and the National Guard's contribution to the country. So I would like to be there as that representative. Um, even, even though General Sweeney, I know, was in the Air Guard after his uh, service uh, during World War II. But uh, I think it's important for people, if they visit that and they look at it, to see uh, that, that other component and that other aspect to the citizen soldier. You know, dating back to 1636 here in, in Salem, at the Salem Green, the first muster on December 13th. So I'm very proud of that, that citizen soldier history. So I look at it, and that's how I'm, how I'm kind of trying to put it in perspective, because as I said, it's, uh, it's humble, uh, the, the humbleness of this, I just can't say enough about it. I mean, I'm still a, a kind of uh, in shock that it's happening, and that, it, and that it's gonna be me that's, that's gonna be representing that, that body of uh, citizen soldier. Well, it's, it's, uh, I think it's important. I remember when I first approached General Dunford about it, um, he wanted no part of it, and uh, he, he really talked about it's about the enlisted men and women, and, and I reminded him that uh, we've got monuments all across the city for enlisted men and women, but it's, it's about the leaders of the military as well. Uh, and uh, and because he eventually agreed, uh, and we did discuss uh, ways to honor our enlisted men and women, and we're going to have... Anyone from Quincy that's a veteran that grew up here, went in, or work, lives here now that's a veteran, we're including them in the honorary committee. So it will be a day to honor all our veterans. But in a real way, 
Um, you know, you, I've heard the term modern day patriots. You know, you guys are the modern day patriots. I mean, it's this, this country is incredible. And you think about the history of, of Adams right now, back at and Hancock and, and what they put together. But, but then it was generation after generation of men and women stepping up to preserve what we've known as the greatest country in the world. Uh, there's nothing like it. There's never been anything like it. Uh, and, and that's why I think it's so important for our young people, they understand the tradition, they understand the history that, and who we are uh, as a community and what Quincy represents. So, so I'm hoping the event will be a recruiting tool <laughs> in some ways with some of the young people if they're thinking about it, you know? Yeah. I'll tell you a funny story about recruiting. I was taking my Army PT test over in South Boston because the fishbowl is just a nice place to run you two miles. And a young kid pulled up on his bicycle and we had the Army PT stuff on. And you in the Army? He said, yeah, yeah, we're in the Army Guard. And he said, I'm thinking about that. So I immediately called the recruiter I had on speed dial and I just handed him my phone. And uh, so I don't know what, what, how it turned out. but um, Didn't waste any time on that one. No, no. It's just because, again, I, I believe in it and I think it's great for young kids. It was great for me. It it. it not that I was, uh, you know, going down the wrong road, um, but really wasn't. Didn't know completely what I wanted to do in life, and it, it really set me on a path um, that I've enjoyed the whole way uh, for the for the most of it. There's some work. There's a lot of work involved, obviously, but. Uh, and, back, and back to your other career for a minute, because right now law enforcement has been under tremendous scrutiny, and I think in many ways some very unfair criticism. I mean, it, some some very unfortunate incidents happen across our country. But that wasn't Massachusetts, that wasn't Quincy. And, and I think some have tried to apply that narrative locally. And it, uh, the chiefs are worried, the police chiefs are worried about recruiting and bringing new people up. And what would you say to young people that may be hesitant about going to law enforcement? Yeah, that's it, tough nowadays. It's, it's really, I, I think they're going to pull out of it. I think it's going to, over time, I, I, I hope that, that uh, there'll be some healing and some mending. Uh, you know, no one likes, you know, bad police officers you know, worse than, than good police officers. So. Um, I, th I think in, in Massachusetts, to your point, Mayor, I, you know, I know the state police had a very thorough uh, discipline system and process of kind of policing their own. Um, and I know Boston and the Quincy Police both do great jobs in the community. And I think that's where we differ. I think, uh, you know, being in the community and knowing and being part of the community is really what, what, what helps that. So you don't have those things that flare up. And because the, the law enforcement cannot be detached from the community they serve. They just, they just can't be. And I think in some of these areas where it flared up over, you know, uh, bad circumstances, then, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, then I think that's when, when it, but the, uh, the way that really spread across really the globe, even, uh, like wildfire was, you know, I guess a wake up call for everyone to truly really try to look at it. And, and I don't think anyone's opposed to criminal justice reform either. I mean, if there's going to be goodness in there, uh, you just got to be careful. You don't, you know, handcuff those that are doing that job. Cause it's not an easy job to begin with. So it's got to be real. It's got to be realistic and it's got to be something that uh, is, go is going to be able so you can still protect and serve you know, the communities that, that you work for. But the other thing I always say to people is, and, and I think the, as you talked a little bit about, the military is, is the best place to bring us all together because we're a huge country. We have so many different cultures, so many different immigrant, gro immigrant groups. It's never been done in any place else in the world. And mm -hmm. think about how few problems we have when you add all those things up and the different cultures and different viewpoints and different religions and faiths and 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 uh, and you, you're right the service brings them all together mixes it all up and and produces a soldier or a sailor and airman um, it's, a, it's a great experiment and it, it has been working pretty good it really, it really has and uh, and it, again it's that it's that discipline and that morale and that good order um, that instills that so everyone's on the same playing field uh, regardless of where you, you come from and it's not perfect there's, I mean there's challenges in, in, the, in the ranks as well sometimes but but through leadership you, you work you work through those but it's certainly uh, I, I've certainly enjoyed it for the past you know 39 years and it's been it's, it's been you know a great a great ride so far general I want to thank you for your taking the time out looking forward to the to the event uh, this September uh, I hope your family and friends and Everyone's going to come in and enjoy the weekend because it's, as, as Dunford said to me when I was interviewing him, I said, how does it feel? I asked you the question, how does it feel? He said, reminded me what I had said to him, and it's not about you, but it's, it's about all our veterans. It's about the history of the city, the great heritage that we have here, generation to generation, that link that connects us. And, uh, you know, you're part of that history, and, and I know your grandfather, Frank McGinn, would be so, so proud, General. So thanks for joining me and look forward to seeing you at the event. I appreciate it, Mayor. Thanks again for what you're doing for this. This is a, this is a great initiative and I, I appreciate what you're doing.